Okay, so the memory text we find in Isaiah 1, verse 18, and I believe we're all pretty familiar with it. It reads, Come now and let us, excuse me, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Give me a second to catch my breath. Okay, so normally I just kind of read through Sabbath afternoon's uh, commentary, and it reads, Lost in the land of forgetfulness, if you're driving Ireland along a narrow country lane lined with hedgerows, you may find a way blocked by a herd of cows ambling home after a crunchy meal. Even if no herdsman is with them, they will go their owners they will go to their owner's barn. They will know where and to whom they belong. Uh, it, it's pointing to the beginning of Isaiah for us, and it'll make more sense when I get to Sunday's lesson. Uh, if a small boy in a store gets separated from his mother and yells, I've lost my mommy, he may not know exactly where he is or where his mother is, but amid of sea, a mother is walking through the store. He will know the mother who alone is his own. Sad to say, unlike even those Irish cows, much less little, uh, the little lost boy, the Judeans, forgot that they belonged to the Lord, their heavenly Lord, and thus lost their true identity as the covenant people. Um, I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Okay, so just basically explaining the... Uh, identity crisis there, um, but we're going to look deeper into that. So Sunday's lesson title is Hear, O Heavens. Um, I, you know, I'm going to just start out just briefly, just giving a little overview, just, just briefly, of the book of Isaiah. Anybody know what the name Isaiah means, by the way? Uh, it, it means salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. Uh, it is not only a prophetical book, but it is also a historical book. Um, Isaiah's ministry lasted for 47 years. He was, uh, when we read the beginning of Isaiah, we see uh, that's mentioned, um, it was during the time of, of four kings was his reign. And the four kings were Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, um, which also, uh, the 47 years that he ministered to, and, and who he ministered to was the, the southern kingdom. Because at that time, the northern kingdoms were already being invaded by the Assyrians, and uh, not, not uh, Egypt at this time, but... Uh, he was, he was bookend between the two longest reigning kings of those four. And uh, what I mean by that is their reign, of course, was the longest out of all the kings that reigned in Israel. Um, so what else? Uh, he was killed by Manasseh. Uh, we believe that he was a son in two. Um, the scriptures often say uh, in Hebrews 11, you know, that uh, some of the prophets, which probably naming... Isaiah, as one of them, was uh, sawn asunder, or in other words, cut in two. Uh, so he was killed by Manasseh. Uh, his ministry, as I mentioned, was the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom was already being plagued by Babylon, um, which ultimately in 606, or excuse me, 586, uh, they were ultimately destroyed by the Babylonians. Uh, does anybody know how many kids, or did, he, did Isaiah have any kids? Yeah, he did. Mainly he had uh, two sons, which interestingly enough, I'll mention that one of the sons, anybody know the name of, of the main son that's kind of of importance, and the reason I say that I'll mention in just a minute. No? It's kind of hard to pronounce the name. Um, give me a second here. Um, so the son whose name was Meir Shalal Hazbaz, 
or Hashbaz, excuse me, uh, he was act actually an anti-type, or excuse me, a type. And when I say that, I mean a type of Christ. In what way? In the way that uh, symbolically, he w when, he, when, when uh, Isaiah had the son, uh, it was during the time where they were right about to be um, utterly destroyed by the Babylonians. Um, and so this son, let me just read what I wrote down. Um, it, it was a sign guaranteed God's temporal salvation of Judah. So in other words, the reason that he was like a Christ because there was impending judgment that was coming upon Judah at the time. But when he gave them this son, they were spared from that judgment for a short period of time. Okay? Everybody get that, right? Everybody's got that? Okay. So, so yeah, so that was the main son. And, and as I mentioned, he was a, a type of Christ. A um, couple other things just to mention. Um, was Isaiah married? Who was he married to? Doesn't say. Yeah, no, it just says that he was married to a prophetess. Um, either she was a real prophet, or we don't really know, but uh, it could just be also that because she was married to a prophet that she was called a prophetess at this time. Um, he, Isaiah, Isaiah number one is the most quoted um, prophet in the New Testament. And also... Um, there's a couple of prophecies in there that were already foretelling the future, which uh, Isaiah mentioned Cyrus. Cyrus was the um, Persian king or commander at that time that uh, led the, um, uh, he led the Persians into the overthrow of Babylon. And also, um, Alexander the Great is mentioned by Isaiah but not by name. But Cyrus is mentioned by name. Um, his prophecy ultimately, his prophecies ultimately find their fulfillment in the Assyrian and Babylonian conquest. Um, you know, when God's people are in a time of uh, apostasy, God always sends a prophet to them. And Isaiah and Jeremiah were two of the major prophets that were sent at that time to give the warnings to Israel uh, about the um, encroaching judgment that was about to fall upon them, okay? Um, he also foresees, uh, uh, Isaiah also foresees the coming Messiah who would ultimately deliver God's people, Yahweh's people, from the wrath that was to come, okay? So as I just mentioned, okay. So Sunday's lesson uh, is Hear, O Heavens. Isaiah 1, 1 through 9 is what we're looking at. So if you guys want to just turn there, if, if you have your Bibles with you. Um, so the lesson says that uh, the book of Isaiah briefly introduces itself by identifying the author, son of Amos. Son, son of Amos. Anybody know what that name Amos means? No? Um, it's uh, uh, Son of My Strength, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so the source of his message, a vision, and his topic, Judah and its capital, Jerusalem during the reign of four kings. So that's what the main focus is on, is on, uh, as I mentioned, the southern kingdom, which remember at this time, the northern kingdoms were already being besieged upon by Assyria. Um, the topic also identifies Isaiah's primary audience as a people of his own country during the time of which he lived. The prophet spoke to them concerning their own condition and destiny. By mentioning the kings during whose reigns he was active, Isaiah narrows down the audience and ties the book to the historical political events of a certain period. Uh, this time frame directs us to the account of 2 Kings 15 through 20 and 2 Chronicles 26 through 32. Okay, so um, Isaiah 1, verse 2. Can I get a taker on that one that would read that for me? I would like to take that. And if not, I can take 
Okay. Okay, so the lesson asks, what's the essence of the message here? What is the Lord saying? How has this idea been seen all through sacred history? Could it be said of the Christian church today as well? Explain your answer. So what is the essence of the message there that we just heard? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what were some of the what were some of the uh, um, what were some of the things that the that the problem with Israel or Judah was at that time? Um, if we go to four, what is it telling us? What is the problem with Israel? Uh, four says. Alas, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel, they turned away backwards. So, you know, it's just giving us the beginning, of course, of, of, of um, Isaiah, but, you know, they were involved in a lot of uh, iniquitous practices, idol worship, um, I had a few things written down, some of the things also. Um, but yeah, they had gone astray. They rebelled, the Lord said. Um, it, it, I like the question. It says, could it be said of the Christian church today as well? You say yes? Everybody else agree? Anybody disagree? Okay. Sure. And I think it's the same way with our churches around America. Even before COVID hit, they were forgetting God, of course. Putting mm -hmm. God away. Sure, sure. Um, we tend to put God on the back burner because our lives tend to get maybe complicated or we get involved with other things that we shouldn't be involved in, maybe. Um, yeah, so, so that's what's going on here. But when he says, Hear, O heavens and earth, the... Um, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. What, is, what do you think he's saying there? Is he talking to the sky and the earth? Or, or what is God really saying when he says, Hear, O heavens, and earth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, he, he's, he's asking for a witness, you know, and of course it's not the earth can't witness to anything. I mean, uh, a lot of times when we say world or earth, you know, there's, I think, three different meanings in the Bible when you talk about world. You know, we have the world itself, but then when we say world, it could also mean the people of the world, right? So when it's talking, yeah, when it's saying hero heavens, it's talking about the celestial beings or the, the heavenly beings, the, all of the angels in heaven and all of the people on earth. God is saying, listen, hear, and, and he's, he's giving an account for a witness. Um, so I'm just going to read uh, the bottom part of the lessons. He did not refer to other gods as a witness. As the only true God, he called instead for the heavens and earth to fulfill this role. Uh, Deuteronomy 4.26 uh, kind of gives us an example of that. Um, if, if somebody could turn there for me and read it. If not, I'll go ahead and read it. Deuteronomy 4.26. Would somebody like to take that? Deuteronomy 4, verse 26. Okay, thank you. So, uh, who is speaking there? Oh, if it was Deuteronomy, it was probably Moses, right? <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so that's just giving another example. You know, there's other examples too where heaven and earth are called 
Um, so that's really what's being said. Uh, the bottom says read exactly, or excuse me, read carefully Isaiah 1, 1 through 9. Summarize on, summarize on the li lines below the sins of what the sins of Judah were. Um, so if you just want to look just briefly, uh, and, and if you guys just want to just maybe raise your hand or just call out what some of the sins were. I read them earlier the same. Um, verse 7 says that they also were teaching others to do the same and that they were sick from head to toe. So, you know, there were a lot of iniquitous practices. You know, they, they, would wor they were worshiping idols at this time. Um, you know, they, they, had, uh, <clears throat> they had all types of practices that were going on that, that were totally uh, rebelling against God. Okay, uh, let's just go to Monday's lesson. Any, any comments so far? No? No? Okay. Um, rotten, ritual, rotten ritualism uh, is what the, the heading reads. And uh, we're looking at Isaiah now, uh, 1, 10 through 17. And uh, Isaiah 1, 10. Um, anybody want to read 1, 10? Why do you think he's mentioning Sodom and Gomorrah here when he's talking about uh, Israel? Um, yeah, uh, so we know Sodom and Gomorrah was, we've got two places in the Bible. Uh, we have in Genesis, we've got the flood story, right, where the people were so wicked they were the most wicked of all time, right? They were the most wicked. And also, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So, but why is he, so you said because, uh, because of the destruction that was coming upon them? Yeah, so ultimately what happened was they pretty much had almost the same fate uh, when you think about what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, they were, they were burned up, right? Was uh, Jerusalem burned up at one point? Yeah. yeah. Right at the same time that Isaiah is preaching and giving the warnings, eventually their fate was pretty much the same fate as Sodom and Gomorrah, although Sodom and Gomorrah just disappeared off the face of the planet forever, which Jerusalem at the second, uh, this was the second time that they were um, just not destroyed, but the second time by the Babylonians, ultimately destroyed um, and never rebuilt back again, right? I mean, the city's still there today, unlike Sodom and Gomorrah, but they basically suffered the same fate as Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's why God is mentioning and calling them like Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, the, the rulers, the peoples, the religion was corrupt violent oppressors, um, the, the priest and uh, the elders and the people of God at that time. Uh, if you were to look in verse 21, jumping ahead, you know, it says that they were greedy, they were murderers. Um, 2 verse 8, they were idol worshipers. In, in verse uh, 2 verse 6, it says that they were also involved in witchcraft. So they had a lot of things going on. And so when we say a, a apostasy. Yeah, they were at the height of apostasy at this point. Comment? Yeah, so I think that's when Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a case of they were trying to Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I like the fact that you mentioned, you said one thing that, uh, you know, there was a difference between Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah weren't God's people. Israel was God's people. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, uh, 
so the question asked when it tells us to read uh, Isaiah 1, 11 through 15, why did the Lord reject the worship that his people were offering him? So remember, again, it's rotten ritualism. So let's take a look at uh, 11 through 15. So 1, 11 through 15. Give me one second here, Sunday, Monday, okay. So if we looked at verse, it, it's actually showing 1, 10 through 17. Um, so again, what is the Lord telling the people there? And, and uh, did he reject their worship? that the people were offering? Why did he reject, why did he reject their? Mm, okay. Okay, okay. Um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, it was an outward form, right? The outwardly meaning that there was nothing inside as far as, you know, a contrite heart, a, a, a repentant heart, as you mentioned. Um, so it was just all formalism that they were just going through the motions. So yeah, as you mentioned, uh, you know, verse 11, he says, I've had enough of your burnt offering rams, the fat of, uh, of fed cattle. I do not delight in uh, the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. He says, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my court? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbath, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. Um, yeah, so it was all these things that were just uh, a, an outward form, and there was nothing uh, of, you know, repentance or, or contrition of heart. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to let her comment. I don't mean to point. I apologize. Go ahead, sister. You know, so talking about Christ's identity, this is a big difference. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, it was kind of a, a false identity, you know, uh, uh, showing that, you know, we are God's holy people, but yet the way they were living their real lives, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, greedy, murderous, um, you know, involved in all of these ritual uh, idolatrous practices, 
So, yeah, thank you, sister. Uh, go ahead, brother. No. There's, there's two different types of Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, because it says Sabbaths, yeah. not Sabbath. So you always got to, when you're reading, keep that in mind, of course. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yes, go ahead. 17, we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah, and we think first of all of the sexual immorality. But one of the big sins of Sodom and Gomorrah was they were not uh, helping the poor. And so 17. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and that's ultimately what God wants, is that for us to be selfless in helping others, right? Uh, yeah, uh, so interesting enough, it says learn to do good. Uh, number one, uh, you know, when we turn to God, we don't just automatically change. It's a process. Um, and interestingly enough, I like that it says learn to do good. You know, we don't need to learn to do evil, do we? That just comes naturally. It really, truly does. But, but learning to, to be good is something that we're taught from a very young age, right? So God is saying, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke, uh, rebuke the oppressor. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, sister. Uh, uh, any other comments? Okay, I'm just going to read from the lesson study just a little bit. It says, uh, the same hands that offered sacrifices and were lifted up in prayer were full of blood that is guilty of violence and oppression of others. Uh, the bottom reads, people who offered sacrifices without repenting, there you go, brother, as you mentioned, the repenting part, from unjust actions towards other members of the covenant community were performing ritual lies. And I'm going to read the bottom line. It says, uh, their ritual actions said they were loyal, but their behavior proved they had broken the covenant. Um, yeah, so they had a covenant with God, and, and that's part of the issue here. Uh, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Uh, we're going to look at the bottom here, and we're going to see what that, what that means. Uh, but by the way, what, can somebody give me the, the, the definition of repentance? Or just give me a, a, a um, paraphrase of what repentance exactly is? Because some people think, you know, I just say, as, as you mentioned, oh, sorry, Lord, you know, and then they just go about doing the same thing that they were doing before, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, so in other words, uh, re true repentance is I'm going down a path this way, and then repentance means that I, I turn and go the other direction, right? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Dina, or <laughs> I saw her head up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, brother. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, thank you, brother. So uh, following uh, added to turning from. So yeah, that's good. I like that. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, so the bottom reads, and, and I'm going to comment on this because uh, I think that it, it ends up being a good understanding for us. It says, read Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. So if we look at 16 and 17, uh, let's just, do I have it here, 16 and 17, uh, it says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good as we read, justice, rebuke the oppressed, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Um, it says, uh, 
What is the Lord commanding that his people do? How do these verses in the context parallel what Jesus said in Matthew 23, verses 23 through 28? Um, so let's just take a look just briefly at, at, at what Jesus said. What message can we find for ourselves today in these texts and, the, and in the context in which they are given? So yeah, as we saw in, in the verse prior to that, it says, uh, cleanse yourself, stop doing evil, learn to do what's right, help orphans and widows, um, justice, mercy, honesty. So uh, there's a parallel here with what Jesus was saying. And of course, you know, we're looking at uh, 700 years difference here from the time period of, what, uh, of Isaiah to the time of Jesus. Uh, so Matthew 23, verses... 23 through 28. We're all pretty familiar with it. I'm just going to read it just briefly. It says, Woe to you Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and, are, and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of your cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like washed white tombs, and indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. What a parallel, right? It, it, it parallels exactly what was going on during the time of Isaiah. And so what was Jesus really saying in all of that? He, he's saying that, you know, yeah, outside, yeah, you look great and holy and, you know, you appear a certain way, just like the cup, you know, but if... if the inside of the cup is not clean. Would you want to drink from it? If the outside was really clean, but the inside isn't clean? No. So God is saying really, ultimately, truly, everything that has to do with God is not the outside. You know, the outside is, you know, fruit of the Spirit, I'll just say. Or, excuse me, um, the lust of the flesh. The inside is the fruit of the Spirit. You know, how, how do we worship God? with, with our, our, our outwardness, our hands, and, and the works? How do, we, how do we really truly worship God? So it's impossible for us to change ourselves and be good. The only way we can do that is to look to Christ and Amen. see. And see what he's like and start to appreciate what he's like. And then we start to realize how these things are bad. And then repentance comes. When we actually see the results of Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Any other comments? Yeah, so it's the inside. The inside, the reason God says the inside, because what's on the inside? Our heart and this, right? And I point there, of course, because uh, it's the frontal lobes that uh, we have our, uh, all of our, um, um, our morals, where our morals come from, and also how we communicate with God. So yeah, it's the mind and the heart, which ultimately should go together. They're usually separated, but they should go together. And that's what God is talking about. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says the inside. Okay, any other comments? Okay, well, let's go on to Tuesday's lesson then. Um, the argument of forgiveness, Isaiah 1.18. After going over it numerous times, write what you believe the Lord is saying here. Read a few verses beyond it to get the whole context. So uh, do I have any takers for verse 18? In Isaiah 1? Anybody want to read that? Okay, thank you, sister. Um, so, you know, when you think of snow and blood, they're almost complete a complete contrast, aren't they? You think of that, that bright red blood and then you see that bright red 
or excuse me, that bright white snow, right? And then also I was told that, uh, and it says that they shall be as wool. I mean, normally we don't think of wool as being really super white, right? But back then they had the ability to dye the wool to where it would be like super bright and white. And so that's the contrast that God is saying. Um, so it says read a few beyond that. Um, uh, so even though, because what God is saying there, he says he's giving the contrast. He's showing what their sins were like, but then he's showing what is, he, what is he showing? I'm not going to say it, but what is God saying there and what is he showing through this verse? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you, sister. So did everybody hear that? So he's basically just showing them their condition, but he's given them an opportunity, right, to be able to turn from that and, and to be redeemed. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, I'm just going to read the middle here before I go on. It says, come now, let us argue it out. So when it says reason, by the way, you know, when we think of the word argue, we kind of think it's kind of a negative thing, right? Because we were like, well, we don't want to argue. But believe it or not, that word reason, that's what it's really saying. It's, it's, it's an argument. And an argument isn't necessarily a bad thing when it comes to God. I mean, he wants us to stand up for what is good and what is right, right? And, and, and to defend God's word, right? So a lot of times we, we come into this argument, but it should never come to anger. Once it comes to anger, then it should just stop. But other than that, when he, when he says, let's reason together, let's argue together, he's saying, you know, let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. Let, let's see if we can come to a point, you know, where we can find peace or, or understanding. Yes, go ahead, sister. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so he, he says, let us argue it out. Isaiah 118, we can see the Lord still seeking to reason with his people, still seeking to get them to repent and turn from their evil ways, no matter how degenerate they have become. Uh, you know, uh, once again, naturally, we are not drawn to God and to goodness and good things. Um, but... You know, I heard Doug Batchelor was saying, and, and I've heard that many times before, that when we pray, you know, we should ask God to help us to want to be obedient. You know, make me, Lord, to want to be obedient. And he will answer that prayer. I mean, he can't force anything upon us, but yet he can do everything else, right? And he can answer those prayers if we ask him sincerely. Yes, sister, go ahead. Going back to the verse about white as snow, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to read the rest of the, the beginning part. It says, why are sins red? Because red is the color of blood. Um, and it, a, a blood guilt that covers the hands of the people. Um, white, by contrast, is a cover, color of purity. There you go. Beautiful. Uh, the absence of blood and guilt. Here God is offering to change them. This is the kind of language King David used when he cried out to God for forgiveness for his sin of taking Bathsheba and destroying her husband. Um, God's argument is an offer to forgive his people. So that's ultimately what it is. He's just saying, hey, look, you know, I know you have these sin issues, but I'm, re I'm willing to forgive you. You know, but upon condition, of course, of repentance and turning from that because he's not going to forgive us if we keep going in that and eventually grieving the Holy Spirit and not changing um, okay so how does God's offer of forgiveness serve as an argument for them to change their ways uh, if we look at Isaiah 4 verse 22 so if, if you were given a death pardon and you were on death row and somehow the God offered you a pardon, um, do you think maybe, I mean, it could happen, you go back out there and just commit the same crime and end up back, or do you think maybe you might want to change your ways because of the pardon that you've been given? Chances are you probably would want not to go back to where you were, right? Being on death row. And that's ultimately what God does for us because we all have a death sentence, right? But God is saying, look, I'm willing to forgive you that death sentence. And all you have to do is just change your ways. You know, just repent. Turn to me. That's right. That's right. Okay, so I'm just going to read the bottom here real briefly and see if we can get to Wednesdays. Now we see the purpose of God's sharp words and warning against his people. They are not to reject his people, but to bring them back to him. We start off in the red, owing a debt we can never repay. From the humble position of acknowledging our need for forgiveness, we are ready to accept everything God has to give us. So, yeah, uh, I, I outline that word, acknowledging our need for forgiveness. You know, we have to make an acknowledgement, first of all, that we need redemption, that we need a redeemer. Because if we don't get to even that point of acknowledging even our sins, how are we going to get past that and get to where we need to be with God? Okay, um, and it's going to talk more in Wednesday's lesson. To eat or be eaten. Isaiah 19 through 31, what theme appears here that is seen all through the Bible. Anybody want to comment on that? If we've done the lesson study or even if we haven't. Um, there is a theme that runs all through the Bible, right? Especially with God's people. Well, it is God's people because the Bible is all about God's people. Um, so what's the theme? You know, I always say that when we read the scriptures from the very beginning to the very end, we always see a pattern. And when I do this, I, the pattern is like a roller coaster ride. You know, uh, God's people will be in a state of apostasy down here. God will raise up a prophet to bring them back to a place where they become holy. And they do in the Bible. They come to that place always where they just become God's holy covenant people. But eventually, over time, they start going downhill to where eventually they get right back to that state of apostasy again. Um, do you think we're, at, what, what state do you think we're in currently as a church or as a people, as God's people? Do you think we're up here or do you think we're in the middle or do you think we're down here? Okay, I was going to let you guys comment on that, but. No, I'm not judging. I, yeah, I'm, I'm part of this assembly also, so I say to us as a whole. Yes, brother, go ahead.
Yes, yes, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, brother. Okay, um, so uh, there's a theme that appears here, uh, and I'm going to read the uh, verse 16 says, uh, No, I'm not going to read 16. I'm just going to read what the lesson study tells. I'm going to follow the lesson here. Uh, it says, Notice the logical structure in Isaiah 19 through 20. If the people choose to be willing and obedient to God, they will eat the good of the land, Isaiah 119. Let me just read that just briefly. Um, I don't have it here. Uh, okay, it says... Uh, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So they, they basically have two options, right? It's if you obey, you'll eat the good of the land, right? You'll be prosperous with God and, and uh, what, what he wants for us. Uh, but if you, if you refuse then what happens? Or if you rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. Um, interestingly enough, that is what ultimately happened to Judah and Israel, right? They were devoured by the sword. Uh, you could probably take that both ways, though. You know, the, the Word of God is, is also called the sword, right? Yeah, double-edged sword. Um, so they had a choice. It was either blessings or be devoured, eaten by the sword, right? Um, so Isaiah it, uh, 1 reiterates and applies the words of Moses recorded in Deuteronomy 13, or 30, 19, and 20 uh, at the time when the covenant with the nation of Israel was set up. Uh, okay, so the lesson tells us, look at the words from Moses. Moses. Notice there is no middle ground. It is either life or death, blessings or curses. Why do you think or excuse me, why do you think there is only one of two choices for us? Why can't there be some sort of middle compromise? So what is happening here? Why is it that God is saying, do this, be prosperous, do this, be devoured? Is there a reason? I mean, uh, I mean yeah, there's all kinds of reasons. I know it's kind of a vague question, but there's one thing I'm trying to get at here. Does anybody know what it is? Does he, do you know why there's no middle ground, why it's either one or the other? Mm, yes, I'm looking for something a little bit more than that, though. I'm trying to get at something a little bit more of what God is really saying here. Did Israel have a covenant with God? They did. What's a covenant? It's like a contract, right? Uh, he's speaking in a language that the people understood. You know, when other nations would come into an agreement with other nations, they would have these contracts or these covenants. And there were stipulations that applied. You do this, and you keep the agreement or the contract. If you don't, then you break the contract, and there's consequences, right? That's what God is saying. God is saying that he had a covenant with his people, and uh, it's either you keep the covenant because... Is God going to break the covenant? No, right? He's going to keep his end of the covenant. But as a people, they ended up breaking the covenant. And so he tells them, well, if you break the covenant, this is what's going to happen because you guys went into an agreement with me. Right? Is that true? Any comments? Any takers? Okay. Um, I'm going to read the bottom and see if it helps explain a little bit better for us. These words of Moses summarize a series of warnings and blessings, curses. We didn't read it, of course, but uh, if you just take a look at it, you'll, you'll see. We don't have time to go through it all. Um, I'm going to just read. Just, I'm gonna, just let me go back here. Okay. It says, uh, blessings and curses that conclude the formation of the covenant in Deuteronomy 27 through 30. Elements of this covenant include, number one, recounting of what God has done for them. Two, conditions, stipulations, commandments to be observed in order for the covenant to be maintained. See, there you have it. Reference to witnesses and blessings and curses to warn the people what would happen if they violated the covenant conditions. So there you have it. I'm just going to read the bottom and we'll see if we have time to get to it Thursday. 
uh, it says, uh, the nature and consequences of the mutually binding relationship into which they were choosing to enter, the potential benefits of the covenant were staggering. But if Israel broke their agreement, they would be worse off than ever. Okay, let's, any, any comments? All right, let's go to Thursdays. Ominous love song. Uh, so Isaiah 5, 1 through 7 is what we're looking at here. Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. So we're just going through Isaiah here. Um, interestingly enough, you know, when you think of what's, what's the longest uh, book in the Bible? What is it? No, no, the, not the longest verse, but the, the longest... Or, or, excuse me, um, what is the longest, yeah, the longest book in the Bible? Jeremiah? Yeah, it's Jeremiah. Isaiah is really close, but when you count words, Jeremiah is longer than Isaiah. Um, that's why they're known as the major prophets. But, um, so, the, so, when we look at um, Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, Give me a second here, because it kind of mi mixes. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just go over just briefly so we all, we're all on the same page of Isaiah 1, 5 through 7. Uh, so he says, I will sing my beloved a song, uh, my beloved touching his vineyard, my beloved, my well beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with a choice, the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked and it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Uh, by the way, those wild grapes, when it says uh, uh, those are like, Stinky grapes, right? Fermented grapes. Uh, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men, well, not fermented, but just rotten. And Judah, I pray that between you and me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. And now go to I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up and broke down, the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. It shall also command the clouds that they do not rain upon it. So he goes on to tell us in this parable, in verse 7, it says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So the vineyard spoken of is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. So, in other words, the vine, the vines, and, and the fruit are represent, representation of the men of Judah, right? The people. And it says, uh, And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness. So, the parable is speaking, and Jesus also spoke of this same in a parable, didn't he? Right? And so what is really being said is God is showing that he's done everything that he could. And when he says everything that he could, when we see in Matthew, ultimately God ends up doing everything possible to the point of even giving his own son. I mean, how much more could you do, right, for a people in offering up your own son to die? So this is what's going on with this uh, 
that we find in, uh, in Isaiah. I'm going to have to end it on that note. I wish we could talk more about this, but we're out of time, so I'm just going to give a prayer for us. Uh, and thank you for your participation. I appreciate that. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we're so grateful to have this study of Isaiah, Father, the, uh, the warnings to your people that are still... Uh, that we are still binded by today according to your covenant that was given to us, Lord. We just ask that today, uh, as we leave, Father, that uh, we will go out and uh, really uh, search the scriptures of this uh, new quarterly you've given us that uh, we might seek to find a better understanding, Father, that, uh, that we will be a people that will be willing and waiting, Father, for your soon return. Um, I just ask that uh, we will search the scriptures as we leave here today even deeper than we've started on today, Father. I also pray that uh, blessings for the leaders and, and our speakers today. And uh, I pray that everybody here will be blessed today through your word and by your word, Father. And uh, I just ask that today that Jesus will be the focal point of all that we do today in our worships. And uh, Lord, I just ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Thy will be done. Amen.